intro, Greg. Um, this is my first CloudShare support session, so thanks to the guys for giving me the opportunity to present this to you. Um, I'm going to look at a really useful tool in the classroom, which I'm sure that everyone that's currently here is already using, and which is YouTube. Um, if you want to have a look at the presentation as I'm going along, that's the link, so feel free to take it, use it as you will. If you can just make sure you just make a copy of it. Um, there will be a bit of sort of a hands-on section a little bit later on where I will be jumping over to uh, YouTube. So just sort of be aware that I'll be jumping between the two screens as we go along. Might give people, do you want to give people a couple of seconds just yep. to jot that down? So I'll give you a moment just to jot that down. Oh, lowercase, very nicely done. That's an L rather than a 1, I gather. E-W-L. HR zero, uh, HRO. HRO. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, I think the first thing that I guess people associate when they talk about YouTube is, you know, the the viral celebrity, um, the 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 funny cat clip, the you know, the finger getting bitten, the music video that's gone over, you know, so many hits. Um, and, you know, that's, that's actually quite a big part of it, but there's a big factor as well too that we're not looking at and which is, I guess, the teaching and learning side of it. Just a few numbers, I guess, just to sort of pique your interest. Um, just grab some stats off YouTube as well. And if you sort of look at the numbers that they're throwing up, it's very, very scary in a way that you think that there are that many people that are uh, using this particular platform and that many people subscribing and that many hours of footage sort of getting uploaded and ultimately being created on it. It's quite scary, but at the same time, it's a really, really good indictment for technology in the way that it's sort of moving ahead. Um, and I guess as us as teachers and as the students are sort of growing and how the internet and web two tools and everything else just continues to be sort of more and more ubiquitous, um, it's just, the web's just sort of changing and all these tools are sort of changing for us to be more user-centric. And I guess the whole thing about all these Web2 technologies is that sense of creation as well too, and not simply just consumption, not just simply going on a platform, watching a video, but it's really about the user creating something as well too. You can kind of contribute that to what you can call participatory culture. Um, that's, in a real way, that's how our students and ourselves work these days because it's, it offers a couple of things. It offers, for example, really low barriers to artistic expression. So students now have the opportunity, and as everyone else as well, to, to really sort of express how they are feeling, express their ideas, express their thoughts through a whole different range of mediums. Uh, this whole notion of creating and sharing. So as you can see from the graphic there, there are so many different platforms in which you can now create and share. Uh, the knowledge that's been passed on as well too, sort of from one group to another, which is really, really great. And it's just made it so much easier, sort of like what we're doing now. Traditionally, we would have to all physically get together, but this whole sense of, uh, you know, video conferencing, hangouts, chat, it really allows us to connect and to share all our knowledge. Uh, the feedback and the contributions that people make. So when people jump on Facebook, when people jump on YouTube to make a comment, when people like a photo, anything like that, that whole sense of, you know, that immediacy of contributions, that really, really matters. And I guess ultimately as well too, it's a little bit ironic, it's a little bit antisocial that we're connecting via, I guess, an electronic medium. However, that social connection is, you know, is, is, this, is, this is the new way. This is the new way of social connection. Uh, people can actually speak to their relatives overseas uh, that they might not have the opportunity to unless they physically fly over and meet them. So if you just have a quick look there and why I guess YouTube is so prominent in the classroom, um, just from the little icons that you can see there are several educational channels that you can see uh, on YouTube. And from there, you can see KLAs that range from science, maths, visual arts, English, and, you know, so much more. So there is that real, that real platform uh, for YouTube in the classroom. And another funny thing that actually uh, Greg alerted me to the other day was that you will find that students will YouTube something more than they would Google something first. 
which you come to think of it, you tell you tell a student, I'll just put that through Google when there is a big contingent of them, I guess, that would simply, oh no, I'm going to YouTube that and see what visual medium would come up as well too. Um, and obviously on the platform, you can see music videos, uh, talent videos, holidays, documentaries, you know, it's just a whole array of different things that you can find on there. And according to the YouTube stats as well too, you've got more than 70 million uh, million million videos on the site as well too. So once again, some scary, scary numbers. Um, as you know, sort of Google who owns YouTube, they're out there to obviously promote the product as well too, but obviously to make it you know, used sensibly in the classroom as well too. And they've designed a whole bunch of lessons based around YouTube, the whole things about how to flag content, how to be a safer online citizen. And it really brings you to that sense of digital citizenship where we really try to instill with the students. And for me, being a visual arts teacher, it's giving those kids that freedom of expression online and the influence obviously of their teachers that drive it as well too. And it challenges them to really create that digital footprint, but in that real positive way. I think a lot of the times it's focused on the negativity of it all. Don't do this because you're gonna get punished. Don't do that because something bad will come along years down the track. We're not looking at the positive things. We're not looking at the resources that the kids can create. We're not looking at uh, the content that they're uploading. The, their learning, the, the catalogue, this huge array of catalogue of, of their learning that's being put up um, in this online environment. And in another way as well too, it really helps them to be more critical thinkers because it, it, it really questions them as well too. They'll go look for, they'll look for content online. They'll look for a video online on YouTube or something like that. And they will, I guess, ultimately beg the question, what makes a good, you know, what makes this a good video? Okay, should I use this for my research assignment? Should I use this for something? You know, why should I really use it? Um, you know, is the is the content relevant? Is it put out by a respectable uh, organization? Can they see things like bias or anything like that in there? And it really sort of lets them, um, you know, come to their own conclusions about things and really makes up their mind, you know, in regards to a lot of the things that they might find in this online environment as well too. And I guess that sort of comes back to this whole idea of media literacy and knowing how to interpret and tell these stories across not just one sort of medium, but across all mediums is a really, really crucial skill that I guess we have to really build into our kids. And what makes these video sharing sites so powerful is also a part of their complexity as well too. You could use a clip in the classroom and the feedback, the discussion, the you know, the comments that you gain from this are a really robust application that you can use there. Creating and showing these clips and you really, and as the teacher spearheading the direction or spearheading the ideas that are coming out of this is fantastic as well too. And the thing that I really like is about the students creating something and allowing them to upload videos, allowing them to create these videos. I think that's really, you know, the most powerful tool that we can sort of have. The other aspect as well too, is that real sense of authenticity in things that are uploaded, I guess, or in some of these videos that are created. Um, the Greggs and I uh, had the, had the uh, we were fortunate enough to see a educator, George Kuros, speak a couple of weeks ago. And um, one of the things that he was speaking about and he sort of reflects on his blog as well too, is about this whole sense of assessment, um, you know, Kids can write, you know, why, why do kids sort of struggle sometimes if they need to write an essay? Um, why are they sort of put to the wayside sometimes? Because sometimes that learning isn't truly authentic. When they put it in a different medium, like they have here, they know that they've got a real authentic audience. They, they know that people are going to see it. They know that people are going to consume it in a way. And for them, it's that, just that little bit more engaging as well too. And I've just got a quick little sort of snippet from his blog there. And it would be fantastic to start assessing students via these mediums. And I'm sure, you know, I'm sure that some of you are already doing this already in the classroom. Which kind of brings me back to this whole idea of 
the authentic audience and why these videos are so important. Greg's looking at me with a very bewildered face at the moment. Now, I'll give you an example. I'll give you a real life example. Um, I look after some of the PC work at where I am at my school and pastoral, pastoral care. care. And I'll give an example. A year eight boy isn't the most well groomed uh, member of the community sometimes. <laughs> They'll turn up, you know, looking a bit dishevelled some days. It might be 8.30 in the morning. Um, and a simple thing is getting their time properly. Now, I'm notorious for this. I think I, I will need some help from YouTube for this. It's just occurred to me, Donovan, uh, Bridget Dean, St. Ursula's, and Mary McKillop might find it very hard to relate to this example. Oh. <laughs> or maybe oh. not. I'm sorry. It is a little It is a little gender bias. I do, I do apologise. It's all right. There's a, there's a scarf <laughs> video that's just fabulous. You should YouTube it sometime. <laughs> so, for example, a um, couple of boys that would turn up and looking through. scruffy ads. So, for example, you know, they, 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 need, they need that help with the time. Sometimes mum or whoever it is at home just won't be able to give them that help. And they come to school and we used to literally have these little handouts that someone would hand out to them that was similar to this. What, what, what I've got up on the screen at the moment. And it's it's hilarious because they would look at it and they would just, you know, scrunch it up, throw it in the bin. Um, whereas on the other hand, I'd get a group of them together in a room. So just in under two minutes, um, students have a really, you know, I, I, I thought it's quite, you know, you know user-friendly uh, video to follow. It was something that they could take away with them. It's, it gives them that real sense of flexibility. They can take it home. They can do it. They can rewatch it again. They can pause it at any stage. Um, throughout the video, you would have noticed little annotations that would have come up um, for a faster version, for a shorter version, for a slow-mo version. So it gives them all these different options that they can use and things that they can learn, you know, on their own, you know, in their own time, at their own pace as well too. And obviously, just um, by sort of screening it beforehand to see if actually it was, you know, useful for the group of students that you would put it towards. And Albine Valier on the Hangout has commented that uh, you can do the same to wear a scarf. There you go. <laughs> And I'm sure um, Adam, who's watching at the moment, is saying, Donovan, you, ne you never wear a tie at work, so <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. Okay, so let's get started. Just there, I've included uh, the link to, it takes you straight to the editor. And like I said, 
the reason why I'm talking about this particular platform today is because of you know the the sheer simplicity of how this can be done. Um, the YouTube editor is it's not Final Cut Pro, it's not Premiere, it's not anything like that. It is a very basic video editor that's great for editing things you know on the fly on the go and it gives you that real quick product but it gives you that immediacy that rawness that real genuine feel of what is actually happening and anyone can use this anyone can create this it can create content with it all you need is a mobile device internet connection and off you go So I'm actually just going to jump over to YouTube. On the actual uh, presentation, there are just, I guess, some um, how-to steps and things like that that you can, I guess, follow in your own time. Um, but I thought, keeping with that sense of authenticity, I would show everyone how something is, you know, created and uploaded on the actual uh, YouTube editor. So as most of you would have been, you know, would have come to, you would have come to YouTube as a website. Um, great channels that you can subscribe to. Um, as you may know that everyone has their own channel. Um, this is a really good place where everything is sort of centralized. So if you wanna look at the videos, if you wanna, and this, this is about the videos that you have saved yourself and also the videos that you want to upload as well too. Uh, your channels is a really good place to sort of start. As Donovan, you know, just a quick question. Do they need to first sign in when they go to YouTube? or will it automatically sign in for them? Uh, with primary, I think you guys have to sign in a few other times. With um, secondary, generally, if we just sort of click on the link in the top right-hand corner there, uh, we're signed in under our AtSid account. So they'll see a sign-in button? They'll see the a top. little sign-in button up on the top here, just um, top right-hand side here. And you should be able to just sign in with no problems. And the, the, the great thing about signing in as well too, like I said, it keeps all your subscriptions, it um, gives you a bit of a history. I think Greg was looking at mine before and laughing at some of the things that I was watching, so it's always good. Um, but it just gives you that ease of access as well too when it comes, you know, when it comes around to using the actual platform. And this is obviously with their at Sid This is Catholic all with account. the at Sid account. Yeah. If you, obviously, if you have your own personal Gmail or anything like that, you can sign in as well. That, that won't stop you. Um, but personally, my channel that I've got here, as you can see, I just uh, predominantly use it for um, school and work. So, yeah. All right, so the key button here is the upload button, which you will see in the top right-hand side here. So once you click that, it brings you to this screen here, which will give you a few options. Um, couple of things I sort of brought this up yesterday just sort of in conversation upload all your videos and your content first that's that's kind of my little sort of golden rule with it it's I sort of equate it to if you're about to cook something have all your ingredients ready before you actually start making whatever you're gonna make it just makes it a bit easier when it comes to assembling your video um, where you don't have to sort of go back to a file find the file uh, recreate it or change, chop and change something. You've got everything there. Um, it all it all automatically saves anyway, so you won't have to worry about it not saving or disappearing into the ether or anything like that. It will all automatically save for you, so there's no troubles there. Um, so easy ways to like as you would through sort of Google Drive, you can click and select your files. Um, you can make a webcam recording. The picture slideshow. That's quite useful for still static images. Uh, some feedback from some teachers recently and on some of the forums were just saying that it's a little bit sluggish, um, but you can sort of bypass that by just simply inserting photos. Uh, you can do an on-air sort of a broadcast and the one that we're, I guess, primarily gonna be looking at today is just the simple editor. So I'm just going to drop in Okay, so I've just shared, I've just um, started to upload a file. Automatically takes you to another screen. Um, 
as it's loading, and obviously this depends on the size of your file and the length and everything else, it obviously depends on all those sorts of things, you will have time to set up all your settings before you publish your video. And even, as, even before you publish a video, it's saved as a draft. It's saved in a draft mode, so you won't have to worry about losing anything at all. <coughs> Excuse me. So, you've got a basic info tab here, which you can obviously rename your video however you wish. Uh, you can add a bit of a description. You can add tags to it. So, for example, yours might be education. Um, this one is a science video, so I'm just going to tag it with it. Not science fiction. Just press tab, I think. There we go. Okay, a um, couple of settings to be aware of. Do you want to make your video public, private, unlisted? My general rule of thumb is I sort of put it on uh, private at first. So when you finish uploading, sorry about that slight little hiccup there. Once you finish editing, uh, sorry, once you, once you finish uploading, it'll take you to the actual editor. And as you can see here, I have several files that I've uploaded previously, and they're ready to go. You've got a couple of options here as well too. You've got you can look through your videos. The really good thing about the editor that's come on recently is a lot of this Creative Commons content. Now, Creative Commons is a lot of royalty and copyright-free content that you can use. And just even for the last CloudShare support video, I was able to edit it all in the YouTube editor, put in uh, shared music that was, once again, copy to, uh, copyright and royalty-free. And it gives you a really broad selection of what you can use as well, too. They've got a few video clips that you can choose from as well. And if you go and search via the Creative Commons website, you'll be able to find so much more as well, too. But I guess, the bottom, I guess the bottom line is start creating yourself. Uh, you'll be able to insert still images. So here are two that I've previously uploaded. And all you really do is that you just drag them to your timeline down here. And it'll play for a default amount of time. It'll give you a couple of options as well too. Uh, for example, this there's a really, really great function where you can sort of uh, auto fix some of the colors and some of the brightness and the contrast um, that your original image might have suffered when you first took it. You've got a lot of sort of um, different filters that you could apply to it as well too. You could add in text, a whole range of things like that. And when you go back to your video manager, like I said, that gives you the whole range of videos that you've uploaded there. With that one that I've just dropped into the timeline, don't worry about, you don't need to sort of worry about constantly saving because it will sort of stay in your timeline. That's the great thing about it. You don't have to sort of go back, hit save, go back, hit save, go back and hit save. To get back to the editor, just click on the little create button down the bottom left hand side here it defaults and takes you to the audio library. So you've got a whole range of, once again, those Creative Commons sound effects and music effects that are there. So like I was saying, back in the editor, that file is already there. So once again, you don't have to save. Um, I'm just gonna grab a pre-existing clip and drag it into the timeline. So this was a little science experiment the kids did the, did the other day when I was visiting the primary school. Uh, really cool experiment with uh, milk and enzymes and uh, food coloring. So this could be something that could be really good to create in the classroom after you've just done an experiment. Uh, you've got someone filming it. It's a real, it's a catalog, it's straight away, it's that visual catalog of what you've done in that lesson. 
and it's real as well too because the kids see themselves in it they see what they've done in it so i've just dragged that down there both of these files you'll notice that next to each section you'll see these um blue bars just next to each image as well too you'll see these blue bars you'll be able to extend the clip to shorten the clip however you need to and you can just click and drag like that or you could actually click on these forward and backward arrows as well too to adjust it accordingly so here for example it looks like a little um bow tie icon it gives you a whole range of different uh, transitions that you can simply drop and drag into the video. Or between videos. Or between, at the start, at the end. It does like it when um, when it plays through one time. It's sort of it's a little bit more seamless once it plays through. But like I said before, it's it's really uh, quick editing. It's not anything too high end. And as you can see there, it just sort of simply fades out. Um, there are a lot of other functions that you can see in it as well too. So this just gives you a little bit of an overview of um, some of the features that I've spoken about. That's your little toolbar, I guess, that tells you what all the different features are. So you can go through those and play around with some of the settings in each particular one. That was the little blue bar that I was talking about previously, how you could shorten and lengthen a clip. There's a sort of a scissors option as well, too, where you can sort of split it and cut the clip as well, too. That sort of toolbar there allows you to really zoom in on the timeline and if you want to make a cut or make an edit at a particular point you'll be able to use that slider and go right in to the clip to a particular point to sort of see uh, which part you would like to edit which part you would like to add a transition to add a piece of text to or something like that uh, the filters i've just spoken about before this is something that's really, really cool and really, really useful as well too. Um, there's an annotations function, which I'm sure that most of you would have seen in a normal YouTube clip. Something would pop up and say, you know, subscribe now or click this for something else. What the annotations do is that it really adds another layer of depth on the video. So if you're talking about a particular topic, by inserting an annotation, which is essentially just a hyperlink, it allows that, obviously, during the video, it will take you to that particular link. And it's really, really good because you can have a couple of topics grouped together and they will have that real sort of flow on effect going from one thing to another, one thing to another. Now, where that's located, is when you've clicked on your actual video, so I've got this one that's been uploaded, you'll have, there's a little um, basic settings button that I was talking about before, before um, the screen okay. timed out. And so, like I said, you could uh, add your description, add your tags, things like that. There's also an advanced settings as well too. So there's a whole range of things that you can do. Uh, allow the comments to be on or off. Um, you know, if there's particular content on there, not that we would be putting anything up, where it's age restrictable. The one thing that I want to sort of draw your attention to is the license and rights ownership section that's under the advanced settings. I really encourage everyone to put theirs on the Creative Commons attribution, which basically gives everyone else uh, that ability to share and to edit and to work with it. Um, if you select the first one, which is your YouTube standard license, uh, basically, yes, I guess it's, it's yours and you own it, um, I'm not a copyright lawyer, so I can't go into too much detail. But with that one, there's less uh, there's less of an avenue for people to sort of share around 
videos and to take content and to edit it or to you know present it in a new way so i really encourage everyone to sort of look at that creative commons tag and just to, when they you know when you do upload to make sure that you do tag it with that particular attribution um got a bit sidetracked there so the annotations function is as you can see up here Now the really cool thing about the annotations is that you can insert it at a particular time frame or anywhere else on the video. So you've got your little timeline down here. If you feel like you've gone up to a particular point in the video and you wanted to draw the students to some other content that relates to what they're doing, what you can simply do is to go up to add annotation and you get all these great options. You can have a speech bubble, you can just have a, you know, a, a bar, a title, some text, and it'll come up for you. You can customize it once again, however you like. You've got font sizes, you've got colors, uh, font colors. The actual annotation bar can be a particular color. And you can insert a link in there that will take you to another point, which I think is really, really cool. So once you click that link, function down here, paste a hyperlink in, paste another URL in, um, really, really, like I said, adds that extra layer on top of what I guess you are already doing. Donovan, does it have to be a link to another video or can it be a link anywhere? With a lot of the annotations, now there are different levels of uh, YouTube accounts. I think for just your sort of your everyday user that you're watching and you don't really upload much as I think it's called a basic account. If you want to link um, externally, uh, YouTube will will have to, I guess, approve approve your account in a way. And oh, so okay. when, I, when I first started doing this, I thought, oh, hang on, how come I can't link externally? So what will happen is that when you use this for the first time, there's a little blue bar that comes up um, up the top here somewhere from memory and it'll ask you, do you want us to enable your account so that you can link externally or to add videos from external sources and things like that. Mm -hmm. So obviously it won't come up on my one, um, but for a first time user, that will definitely come up and obviously click yes, because that gives you just um, more tools at your disposal for doing things and you know, adding layers to your video, which is fantastic. Um, there are enhancements and other sort of little filters that you can add-on as well too. The really cool thing is that you see the original and the new version sort of side by side. Um, and there are little quick fixes, so if the color's a bit off, if the contrast is a bit off or anything like that. This stabilize button is great. That is really used for if you've shot something, say, handheld, and it's very shaky, it's very blurry. The stabilization button it's not absolutely perfect, but it really sort of um, settles the camera down a little bit and gives you that nice, clean, clear picture as well too. As you can sort of see down here, you can speed things up, you can slow things down. Um, and once again, there are a whole range of different effects that you can explore and that you can add to your video as well too. Was that a blur all faces? Let's have a look. Just under... Enhancements under special effects. So what's that? Obscure the identity of the individuals. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. So if anyone wants to give that a play around, that could be... I haven't tried that myself. No, I haven't given that one a go. Uh, once again, it's that free audio, Creative Commons audio that you can do. Uh, we've looked at annotations. This one I found is really, really useful. And I guess for everyone, you know, for once again, the first time user, be quite mindful of it. Um, subtitles and closed captioning are really good uh really good things that you can have in the classroom for you know that real sense of diverse learning as well too. If you've got a hearing impaired student, 
they should be able to reap the benefits of watching the video and understanding what's happening in it as well too. Uh, with the closed captioning, most big organizations that upload videos do provide a transcript, which is great, and you can normally see it just down, uh, just underneath the videos. Uh, just sort of show you an example. This is one from Ted Ed. And when you click the show, uh, show more button, it normally gives you a little bit more info. Uh, some of them, once again, you can talk about a transcript mode there. It's really important to screen it first yourself because the thing is, YouTube have this, this funny thing where it sort of automatically captions. And now, in essence, it, it is quite good because it picks up the audio from what people are saying. Uh, but if you've got a, you know, a heavy Scottish accent, for example, it will obscure that the, the captions and the subtitling to something completely different. So I would encourage everyone before you actually try that function out, um, check that it's from a fairly big and I guess more reputable uh, uploader. Uh, check the transcript, and especially for your you know hearing impaired student or anything like that, you don't want them getting something that's completely out of left field. So check that transcript, make sure that everything's correct. You can also caption it yourself as well too. Um, I've just included two links for everyone where they provide a captioning service and they sort of give you hints and tips on how to caption particular videos. And like I said, you can do it yourself as well if, you are just, if you've um, got the time where you can actually punch it into your video and that will come all come under your settings of it. And like I said, that's a really, really good tool that you can be using. Just a couple of fi uh, final things. Now, if you've got a video, obviously most of you would click the link up here. You would copy and paste it in somewhere in order to share it. If you look on YouTube's sharing functions, you can see that you can share it through a multitude of different ways. Okay, various social media platforms. Uh, Playlists are great, I love playlists. So if I've found a video that I can really use for a particular subject area, I've got a whole bunch of playlists created. And what I can simply do is just add this to that particular playlist and I can access it just a little bit later on. How I organize mine is it's, I just organize them by sort of subject or by interest, but you can once again organize them however you want. How do you create a playlist in the first place, Donovan? Easy, I will quickly show everyone. So when you're back on the main site, I normally go through, once again, going through my channels. There's a little playlist tab there. And as you can see here, I've got about eight different playlists. You can just simply click on the new playlist button, give it a title. Hit create and it's there. Uh, once again, just check your settings to make sure is this a private playlist, is this a public playlist? Just a couple of things to keep in mind as well too. Um, yep, so we spoke about some of the transcripts. The great thing as well too is just on the sharing, just going back to the sharing part, is to embed it into uh, sites, URLs and sites. So what it does is that it automatically generates the code for you. So if you're a little bit more savvy, I guess, on some of the coding, you can actually insert this in a particular website with great ease. A really good function, I guess a really good part of the functionality of YouTube because it's owned by Google, is that by inserting it into Google products, so for example, Google Slides, like the one I showed everyone previously, all I had to do was go to insert, select the video option, And it will allow you to search directly on YouTube the video that you want, 
it'll give you a link. So that was the one that I used previously. And it'll give you all these different options. Click on it and you'll be simply able to insert it into a Google presentation like you saw from the previous one that I did. So something like another, another really, really good tool to use. As I was just talking about before, the captioning, uh, sorry, the uh, Creative Commons licensing. So there are your two different types of licenses, your standard license and your Creative Commons license. So pick as you will. Now, for anyone that's used, I guess, video editing software in the past, the real bugbear is that you have to render it and you have to wait. Even with something like um, iMovie, which is a really powerful tool, there is still that, that waiting time where you have to sort of sit by and go, oh, it's at 10%, it's at 20%, it's at 30%. Don't have to worry about that anymore because the great thing about once you've started that upload onto YouTube, because it's all cloud-based, you can simply close your lid, get a drink, grab a snack, come back, and when you open the lid, it'll tell you what percentage it's at. Um, for example, I had to visit a couple of schools one day, so I set these videos on to upload, set them all ready to go, shut my, uh, just closed my computer, walked away, uh, came back to it a uh, couple of hours later, all done. So that's one of the great things that you can do with that as well too. Couple of quick things. Um, like I was saying before, every teacher and student has a YouTube channel, which is really, really good. So a lot of the content that you want to share with your students, you can put up. It's that whole notion of obviously making sure that you're checking uh, the content, I guess, before it goes up. Uh, both student, both staff and students have that AdStew and AdSynstew account. So once again, be mindful of the content that is getting put up. Uh, Adam's just asked a question um, on the Hangout. Do you require an internet connection for the video to continue to upload to, to YouTube once you close the lid? So I think I think there's two parts to this, Adam. Um, the first part is actually getting the video from your device up into your account in YouTube. And that usually only takes um, a matter of seconds, depending on the speed of your um, internet connection. Once that's done, the video then needs to be rendered or processed. And I think that was the bit that Donovan was talking about. And that's the bit that can take several minutes or even up to an hour. It's that bit that you don't need to be connected to the internet for. Why? Because the video is already in Google's servers and Google is simply processing that. So uh, in answer to your question, yes, you need an internet connection to do that initial upload, but that's usually pretty quick. But not actively. Um, yeah. But... Once that's done, you don't need to have an internet connection because all of the rendering is done in the cloud for you by Google. Um, so uh, students in primary can obviously upload it. We have this, we had a point where we brought up about primary school students and using YouTube. And obviously it's great that they can use it as a viewing platform. Um, creation, unfortunately, the uploading part is unavailable at the moment for them because for a primary school student, they have to be 13 or over, and unfortunately it breaks the terms of service. However, as the classroom teacher, all this content can still be created, and you can simply upload it sort of via your channel, or via the school's channel, or anything like that. I guess don't let this be a big hindrance to the creative process or the learning process. It shouldn't be. It's just, you know, there are plenty of other alternatives. Um, we found a great one via the Chrome store, which is Wii Video, and some of the primary schools and some of the students that I've spoken to and the teachers I've spoken to, they've taken this on and they're starting to use Wii Video um, as a bit of an editing tool as well because the students in primary can't get onto, uh, can't access the YouTube editor. Yeah, that's because they're not allowed to sign in. Because they're not allowed to sign yeah. in, yeah, which is the unfortunate thing, but hopefully something will change where not too sure, but hopefully that will be fixed for later on. And I guess at the end of the day, why we're, you know, why we're using this particular editor, it's fast, it's effective, it's immediate, and it really, really, you know, gets, it really gives you that sense of instant creation. 
where you've taken the video, you're not making a Hollywood blockbuster, okay? You're not making something massive where it requires a lot of special effects and things like that. So it's raw, it's immediate, it's authentic. And I think that's what we really want out of all the learning and the reason why we're you know, using all these particular platforms. Just lastly, there are a couple of links that I've included. So if you wanna have a look, um, just in regards to some of the YouTube copyright, they made it, I guess, quite user-friendly. Um, a great article in it, um, Edtopia, just about making movies from storybook screen, and Creative Commons as well too, which will allow you to search for a lot of uh, royalty and copyright free material. And that about wraps it up for me. Well, thanks, Donovan. Um... I guess throwing it open to anyone who's got, we've already had a few questions come through on the Hangout. Um, a couple of them we've just answered straight away. Does anyone else have any questions either via the VC or the Hangout around uh, using the editor? Yes, please just unmute your microphone and ask. I was just wondering, it, on a laptop obviously it's very easy to do. Is it just as easy on an iPad? Good question. So the question was uh, for the people on uh, the Hangout, if you didn't hear okay, that. Done. Uh, the question is, um, and it's from Maria over at uh, uh, Mary McKillop, uh, is it just as easy to do this sort of editing on an iPad as it is on a laptop, you know, Chromebook, something like that? Uh, to be honest, Maria, I haven't actually tried it out on an iPad. Um, really good question. Maybe Greg can speak for it. Haven't tried it? Haven't tried it out on the iPad, but I'm assuming that the... If you're going through Drive, if you're going through YouTube, there shouldn't be any huge problems with it. Um, but I will give it a go and I'll let you know. We'll get back to you. Okay. We'll, we'll do we'll that. Experiment we'll experiment too. We'll, we'll do well, that. That can be a little project that we can do. But my okay. inkling, Maria, would be because um, the iPad's got iMovie built into it, and iMovie's pretty good. I mean, it's you know built for the iPad. It's a pretty you know streamlined editor. Um, you might find that it's, and it's got a direct link to YouTube anyway, you can directly upload to YouTube. Um, I think you can directly upload to your Google Drive. Can you save, export it to a Google Drive from iMovie? That's that's something you might want to look at as well, whether or not uh, you can take a, a video directly from the iMovie app and save it into Google Drive. That, that would be one option as well, particularly for primary schools where the kids wouldn't be able to link it to a YouTube account. In secondaries, I think you'd probably just get them to link it straight to their um, YouTube account. Okay, thanks very much. And especially now, with all of the uh, more most current iPads, you get um, iMovie as a free uh, app, so you wouldn't even consider using anything else if you've bought a new one. Yeah. Um, so Alfina Jackson, who's on the Hangout, has uh, made a comment. Uh, I've uploaded a bunch of videos made by my kids to YouTube and safety mode has blocked them at school. How do we unblock? Um, so safety mode is um, on by default in Chrome. Uh, that should, it may be something to do with the categorization. Oh, it's because it's a kid's video, they can't share outside the domain. Is it the no, 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 this is Alfina is uploaded using her account. Oh. So Alfina, do you want to unmute your microphone? You, you're, you're talking about using your account to upload the video, yeah? I removed all of the tags that was automatically put in by when I uploaded them. I removed everything. Right. And everything's pretty much... Um, there's certain videos that are blocked and certain ones that are not. So the kids go into the playlist to watch their videos and only half of them turn up because the rest are blocked. And I've wow. gone through my create. I've uploaded them on my account. They're not through the kids' account. They're on my account. Yeah. And Creator Studio, there's no option to unblock them or to tell YouTube that they're actually safe. There's no inappropriate content. I've gone through them with a fine tooth comb and it's just... Is that a Scott um, question? Yeah, a bit disappointing that, yeah, that it is blocked. And I'm just trying to figure out if there's something that I'm missing in YouTube to block, unblock it or... Look, is... yeah, I think you'd probably have to... We'd probably have to take that offline, Alfina, and, and you'd have to show us... You'll share with us a video that doesn't get blocked and a video that does get blocked so we can compare the two, or have you already done that? Um, I've got the playlist. I can share the playlist, and half those playlists... Half of them are on the playlist and half of them don't 
don't turn up on there when the, when the kids go through the playlist. Okay, so we need to see yeah. a video that does and a video that doesn't, right, so that we can compare them. But, yeah. but have you okay. done that or not? Sorry? Have you compa got, compared two both. videos? I've compared both. Um, I've they're both pretty much have all got identical tags. Um, yeah, so I've looked at the tags, I've looked at all, all the content on both, and they're pretty much like, almost identical. Mm, okay, all right. Well, look, let, let's strange. take that offline and, and have a look at that. Uh, right. Are these videos sure, that you were producing them. using Powtoon? Uh, they were uploaded through Powtoon, so half have been, half, half are showing, half are not. Right, okay, so it's not a Powtoon, non Powtoon thing, no, right? No, no, okay. it's a YouTube issue. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, look, Alfina, just let's take it offline and uh, we'll share back with the Google Guides mm. uh, what the result yeah. of that was. But thanks for raising that. That's first time that that's come so to our good. attention, I think. We got three bits of homework to do already. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so sorry we couldn't answer that straight away for you. Um, but great questions. Any any other questions, folks, either on the VC or uh, on the Hangout? All good? Okay, well, look, thank you very much, Donovan, for sharing that, um, showing us the editor, showing us some of the uses of YouTube in the classroom. Um, oh, here we go. Adam's got uh, one other thing here. Uh, with the 13 plus, so this is Adam over at Trinity, yep. uh, Trinity uh, College. Uh, so Adam's asking, uh, with the 13 plus restriction, does that mean we cannot use this with year seven students or some year eight? Um, you, the students have to verify their age, right? So stu you, obviously you're not going to encourage students to lie when they verify their age. So when they first sign into YouTube, they have to tick a button that says that they're uh, over 13. Um, if you've got some year seven students who are under 13, then unfortunately they won't be able to sign into YouTube. It's a great opportunity to do some group work and just make sure you've got one kid in the group that's already 13. Yeah, that's a great suggestion. Thanks for that, Greg, um, uh, on using group work to maybe get around that issue. Yeah, look, it's, it's, there's no doubt that the 13 plus restriction around not just YouTube, but various other cloud-based products um, is an issue for us, but there's, you know, there's really not much we can do. We just have to come up with creative ways to work around it sometimes. Any other final, so thanks for that, Adam. Um, any other uh, final questions for us? Okay, well, look, it's just gone 4.30, so great timing. Uh, we'll uh, hopefully see you again uh, Wednesday week. Uh, that's Wednesday the 10th, I think, from memory. Just let me confirm that. Um, yeah, Wednesday the 10th in week nine, um, where John Galvin is going to be sharing um, uh, some learnings from uh, a, re a couple of recent conferences that he intended on, attended on building network learning communities and some of his experiences at uh, some of the schools that he's been involved with. So until then... Um, we wish you all the best. Have a great uh, finish to the uh, to term four. Uh, sorry, term three. Ahead <laughs> of ourselves already. And uh, we'll see you again, uh, hopefully, in uh, week nine. Take care, everyone. Mm -hmm.